time to uh time to proceed. I'm Sam Baker, the former chair of the Good Systems uh, Texas Grand Challenge. Uh, we're uh, super excited to be uh, teaming up today with the uh, Institute for the Foundations of Machine Learning and the, um, the group on AI on campus, uh, the FAI, to uh, have Zach Lipton uh, speak. Uh, I, um, I always smile when I say the Institute for the Foundations of Machine Learning because I've spent a lot of time uh, correcting myself because I say the Institute for the Future of Machine Learning. And like, I mean, the foundations of machine learning, but things like today, I feel like we might, you know, might be both things. And that's that's really amazing to uh, be a witness to. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Alex Tabakis is going to introduce our speaker, Zach Lipton. Great. So it's a pleasure to have Zach uh, giving a talk today. Uh, he's a professor in Carnegie Mellon in the machine learning department uh, with also several appointments in the business school and the school of public policy. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's a very well-known public intellectual in machine learning, has had a lot of impact. I'll tell you, I met Zach in a conference many years back. I was working on something super excited. I tell Danima, I don't know if you know this. Uh, I tell Anima, I'm like, oh, I'm doing this. I'm super excited. She says, you should talk to this guy, Zach, because he has already done that. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so uh, then I met Zach, and he has been very influential in my thought. He asked very sharp questions about interpretability, uh, best practices in machine learning. He has had an extremely influential paper. And today, we're very excited to have him uh, telling us about the causal turn in machine learning. Zach, you have the floor. Well, cool. thanks, Alex. Uh... Now I get to disappoint you all. Um, yeah, that's right. So, so, so broadly, um, I guess being a, a kind of interdisciplinary initiative, took the opportunity to uh, put put a kind of higher level talk. So I won't be. Ooh, uh, so got it. Yeah. Oh, that I think I need to bring Zoom into focus, not PowerPoint, as the application one. Oh yeah. All right. The old the old the old dog could still learn a new trick. All right. Um well to to, to paint maybe a higher level picture. I, I won't I won't spend the, the talk like zooming in on one paper. I'll I'll touch on several of, of of the works my lab has done in these various areas, but but try to offer a, you know, a broader perspective on 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 the second thing is interesting, which maybe has been discussed a la carte in each of these different areas, but I haven't seen so much like reflected upon in a more maybe meta scientific way. So, um, you know, the spoiler will be at a high level. Um, we have a kind of like motley collection of uh, problems that they're all they're not specific technical problems, but kind of areas uh, that are grouped together under responsible machine learning. Um, I think, you know, uh, these will include, you know, things like robustness, things like explainability, things like fairness. Um, I think for all of them, uh, what, what are the relevant and important ways to formalize them or sort of open questions, but they certainly seem at least at uh, arm. You know, I don't have a formal definition of pizza and I don't have a formal definition of uh, you know, dumplings, but I, I feel like they're they're not the same thing and the rules that apply to one that shouldn't necessarily apply to the other. So if anything, it, it seems like what groups these things together is that they uh, share a constituency, they share a set of stakeholders, they, they share a set of, uh, you know, um, people are, sim you know, uh, comp people are motivated by problems in one and motivated by problems in the other. And yet they seem to also be sharing some kind of methodological DNA. And, and and one in particular is that um, they've all sort of um, become sites for for uh, a program of research that adopts a sort of maybe like unorthodox use of causality, and and so the question would be sort of like why is that? What is it these problems have in common? Offer some perspective, and and why why is causality playing a role, and and what what's it doing for us, and what's it not doing for us? So. Um, one day, um, I want the courage to give a talk without slides, but in the meanwhile, I'm starting to experiment with just like more slides with less material on them. So I'll have a few of those and a few normal slides. And uh, I, I got random background images to make them props, but you can guess which ones uh, PowerPoint suggests. 
suggested and which ones uh, Dolly suggested and which ones Google Image Search uh, suggested. Um, high level, um, I might use just like we to talk about like work my lab does, but I just want to call out um, in case I um, uh, fail to mention that almost all my work is pretty collaborative these days. And I work with a, um, a diverse and talented group of people and probably problems of concern, uh, you know, foundation with reliable ML. So the big picture. Um, so it's fair. I, I could tell who's from Pittsburgh by the chuckles. Um, so it's big picture is like, I think, and when I say big picture, when I say, I, I'm going to paint like a cartoon that I think is like a, like a pattern that describes all the uh, uh, trajectory of research in all three of these kind of areas. One is uh, something's wrong. So we're deploying machine learning and something's going wrong. Either the systems are breaking, there's concerns about discrimination, there's uh, appeals from stakeholders that they, they, they don't know what's going on inside the machine or they, they don't trust it. But, but, but in all cases, there, there, there's, there's like an unmet want. Um, and, and not just an unmet want, but like, a, you know, maybe this is like jumping to a conclusion, but I think an unmet want that like, it's not just a question of like the, the, the model's not accurate enough, like an unmet want of like a, of, of a categorical kind, something, something's not accounted for. There, there's something missing from the formulation. Um, there's a program of research that doesn't really treat these as categorically new kinds of problems, but just sort of says, let's keep the, the current playbook. Like, uh, let's change, tweak the objective. Let's get more data. Let's, let's propose a different architecture. Uh, but this is like the, the style of thinking about them is saying like kind of still using the, the framing language of, uh, normal predictive machine learning to, to articulate these problems. Then, you know, uh, uh, a bunch of, uh, right, so then what happens is like, you know, people, people start, you know, a bunch of different methods come up, they all seem to be doing completely different things. Uh, people start realizing that there's something, something fundamental, like you can't dodge the fact that these problems are somehow, there's something, there's something missing from, from the recipe. They're somehow, uh, the problem definitions are, they're somehow vague or naive or uh, confused. The, the things that are being called solutions appear to make things worse as often or more often than they make them better. And I think that this applies to domain adaptation hacks. It applies to so-called explainability uh, uh, heuristics. It applies, I think, to um, a lot of, uh, you know, what is being called, you know, sort of like fairness measures that, you know, they're being adopted uh, in a way that just kind of, you know, provides uh, more liability cover than it pro provides like redress for actual harms. So a large body of technical methods accumulates, and then we're in this weird situation. We, we, don't, we don't know if we're working on the right problem, and it's unclear if what we're doing is actually useful. And, and, and it's to be like, clear, I'm not casting stones. I, I feel like I, I sit in this community that is uh, unsure sometimes of what we're doing is useful. And, and I think it applies to theoretical work, and I'll make this claim that even though causality offers us something, we, we're still in this claim. We're, you know, we, we have serious questions about whether what we're doing is useful. Um, so now, all, in all three of these areas, in, in relatively, you know, I guess you can argue about precise dates, but at least in terms of momentum in the research community, if not in terms of like initial introduction, causality kind of emerges as this promising path forward, giving us a, a set of like uh, language primitives, a way, a way of talking about problems that allows us to, to articulate aspects of them that we can't exactly in uh, predictive framing. Um, yeah. So correlation, right, is not just causality by itself. Correlation is, you could, so, so I'll, I'll get into what I mean by causality, but broadly by causality, I mean like the, the, let's say at a thousand foot view, the, the, the causality that, that Uta Pearl talks about that, um, that, that the econometrics community talks about, the causality meaning um, a language for talking not just about correlations among features, but a language for talking about changes to data generative processes, right? So talking about what would, talking about interventions, interventions are the missing primitives. There's not the statistics by itself, you know, or we could argue about what we want to call statistics. You know, it's not about what department you sit in, but like the language of probability by itself does not have a, a primitive that is a, describes the, the, the manipulation of a, of a data generating process of, of one distribution to another and say, what, what do they have in common and what don't they? And what's the interpretation of this? So that, that's what I mean by causality and I'll get into that. 
So the, the key benefit of causality in a lot of places has been conceptual clarity. It allows us to often understand what things are just fundamentally irreconcilable or impossible. It allows us to often even put our finger on what it was that was missing, like at least at a, in, a, in a stylized sense. Um, but causality also produces, like once we adopt the causal framing, we, we then, you know, we're academics and our incentive is not just to sort of say, hey, by, by using the language of causality, I can sort of get at what I, I, I sort of see a little bit more clearly what I meant. We don't just do that, we, we, we propose uh, identification formulae, we propose statistical estimators, we analyze the crap out of them, we provide finite sample bounds, we, we get into the weeds. And, and now the problem here is that is a problem that plagues all causality. Even though a lot of these problems, they look a little bit different from conventional causality problems. The, the, key, the key problem is that, you know, ca what causality makes clear to us is that there is a limit to what we could do from observational data alone, and that ultimately, uh, we either need to do experiments or we need to start making commitments about some kind of model of the world. And now we start depending precariously on these models of the world. And the models of the world are, uh, and I guess like this maybe is like uh, I'm saying something new if I'm talking, I'm not totally new, but at least a little bit fresh. If I'm talking in a computer science community, if I were in an economics department, they'd be like, yes, this is the, the debates we've been having for a million years is that, you know, the, the causal models tend to be stylized models. They tend to be cartoons of ways that the world could be that sort of are, are almost necessarily wrong or almost necessarily overly reductive and, and oversimplified in ways that make it really unclear. Can we actually use the technical machinery or was the benefit that we got all along just sort of like the, the, the framing device, the insight? So what is causality? Um, so Google image search suggests this, and then I realized that like that's the cover photo also, I think from, the, or very similar to the, the Pearl causality primer. By the way, if, I think that, that's a very nice, gentle introduction to causality coming from knowing a bit about probability and statistics, but not knowing causality. I think that the primer, it's a, is it like Madeline Glamour and uh, Uta Pearl from like, you know, it's like an 80 page tutorial, little exercises, but it's great. Um, you're talking about <laughs> I gave a talk like a week ago and someone on the internet, someone on the phone started saying blah, 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 blah. <laughs> they might've been talking about me. I'm not sure. Um, um, at least it wasn't a faculty in the department. No one was quite sure who this person was, but Andy Chen, if you're listening, uh, okay. Um, please mute yourself. Um, narrow view of causality. Uh, there, there's, I think, okay, a lot of people, even if you're a social scientist and you talk about causality, I think the most conventional way that people are used to thinking about causality is just uh, uh, a set of theory methods, practices that are oriented towards making statements about what would be the effects of policy interventions, right? So you want to say something like, given, um, well, just generally, I want to say, what would happen if I if I if I if I made a change in the world? What would happen if I uh, instead of giving a treatment to these people, I gave it to those people? What would happen if uh, instead of recommending, you know, giving a subsidy to these people, I give it to those people? I, I want to make some kind of change in what we're doing. This is the big difference: correlation, correlation. You're just saying we're something natural as something naturally varies in the data process, data generating process, like as it is. Like I don't monkey with whatever is producing data in the world. I'm just looking at as something seems to change what seems to change with it. Here I'm saying, if I were to go in and change, actually manipulate the process by which the data is generated, if I were to go in and actually say, you know, regardless of how people were previously being assigned treatments in, in the healthcare setting, I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna do something different. I'm gonna flip a coin or I'm gonna follow some particular protocol or algorithm, what would happen? Um, so this is an arrow view to so say, that's what we're concerned with. Just like, I wanna make a treatment decision. And then you say, you know, well, the gold standard is randomized controlled trials. Uh, even then, you have to make some kind of commitments uh, in order to interpret the results. Like, do you believe that there is interference among the units and things like this? But, 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 you know, for the most part, you could at least, you know, uh, kind of dispense with a problem of confounding to some degree if you do a true randomized controlled trial. And then 
um, you know, very solid, you know, many, many, many spheres of life where you can't just go and do a complete randomized control trial. You can't just go flip coins to decide who goes to college and who doesn't go to college or decide who gets treatment in a healthcare setting. No, well, actually, you can sometimes, but, you know, only to some degree. Like, there are a whole lot of the, the, the trials that would be informative or, or unethical, they would involve knowingly treat someone badly. So usually when you do a randomized control trial, it's like, it's like within the, you know, you know, okay, I've, I've got a, a proposed new treatment and I'm going to compare it to standard care. And nobody really knows, but, you know, you can't do the experiment that would like um, knowingly treat some people in a way that is probably suboptimal. Um, from observational data alone, in general, you can't overcome the problem of confounding. Now, um, you can get to all kinds of wild assumptions, like the world is perfectly linear and all noise is additive and all noise is non-Gaussian, then you can like and the variables that you observe constitute a causally sufficient graph, whatever, but even that, then you can infer the graph structure. It's not that you can infer nothing, but like even then you're making a whole bunch of commitments about the structure of the world. Um, alternatively, you could say, I, I don't assume those heroic things, you know, faithfulness and non-Gaussian noise, additive noise, whatever, but, but I, I well, non-Gaussian noise is probably the most mild assumption you'll ever make. But um, you say, um, well, I know the graph. You know, some, someone tells me some structural knowledge about the world. What are the possible, what are the set of possible confounders? And assuming that you observe them, that's only one, one approach. You don't necessarily have to observe confounders. You could have a valid mediator. You could have a valid instrumental variable. You have different strategies to say, hey, if certain structural assumptions hold, if the, if the variables that I observe are related in a particular kind of way, then I'm able to observe, uh, determine a treatment effect. It's a narrow idea of what causality is. I'm going to adopt a wider view of what causality is, which is not just that I'm concerned with, I'm looking at the world and I want to say what would happen if I treated someone. Uh, and I'm going to give credit here, um, just pretend it's on the slide, to my colleague Peter Spiertes, who's one of the great philosophers at the CMU department, which were kind of pioneers of a lot of the way we think about causality today. And um, um, Peter, uh, who I think is a, is a very kind of um, influential figure in the, in the history of causal discovery, uh, I saw him give a talk at a symposium, and I like the way his first introduction to causality, he doesn't talk about treatment effects, it's what is causality broadly? It's, it's a language for talking about changes to or relationships among different data generating processes, right? So um, it doesn't, there's, there's lots of ways things might change, there's lots of objectives I have, they don't all necessarily mean I'm in the position of assigning treatments, but, but broadly the question is something like, hey, how can I collect a bunch of data from some distribution or distributions, you know? P or call them P1, P2, P3, whatever you want to call them, and now answer a question about some other distribution. Like I've got some, I've got some, some query that I want to make about like some population Q, and I don't have full observation of everything that I care about. I don't have direct access to it. How, how can I make a statement about that on the basis of data that was collected from a different distribution? Like, you know, if, if I ask you, what is the average uh, height of people in the United States? And you are like, say, well, I'm going to go uh, measure the heights of people in uh, Sri Lanka, and then I'm going to take the average. It's like, what, what, you know, like you can't say like this is going to converge to that. Like you say, I have a completely different population. What gives you the right to make a conclusion about a parameter of one population on, on the basis of measurements from another? And ultimately, this comes down to some set of commitments about, well, what is the underlying structure? What do these populations have in common? And if you can't make any commitments at all about what they have in common, the answer is in general, well, you can't say anything. Um, so this is going to get to what we're talking about because when we talk about domain adaptation or talk about robustness, it's like here, 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 we're not about, we're not in the position of assigning a treatment, but we could say that that the, the the intervention is hey we were living in a world that that was like this, and something changed between the the the, the population that that generated the deployment data and and what we're seeing at test time. We're not the ones who did the intervention, you know. God did the intervention, or you know, whatever some institution did the intervention. Something changed. You know, the hospital adopt a new intake form and suddenly they're measuring features with different level of missingness, reliability. Something changed. We're not the ones who changed it, but still in light of that change, given some set of things that we observe, say in a classic domain adaptation setting, like labeled source data, unlabeled targeted, I, I want to make a statement about um, some, some parameter of interest on the target distribution. What's the optimal predictor? What's the, what's the, you know, the, 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 class proportion, something like this. Um, so the question is like, right, broadly, how and when is it possible to collect data from one population and answer questions about another? Um, cool, and, and and broadly, like, you know, just, just for, I mean, it might be old hat for some people, but 
just just the thing about these and probably the way, way these things are conceptualized at least in kind of cartoon models is we think about if we think about a probabilistic graphical model uh, a, a probabilistic graphical model in a classic statistical sense like as also introduced by <laughs> Uta Pearl but um or at least you know the use of DAGs in in in, in the AI community um but before he was on the causal train uh the the interpretation of of a normal just um Bayes net is just a a, a set of con implied conditional independencies that that is that is the beginning and end of it like uh like this this is a valid net if and only if like the the the, the independencies that hold in the graph also hold in the real world and if all the independencies that hold in the uh you know, all the dependencies that could happen in the graph also happen in the real world. Then we say that like the real world is faithful or the graph is faithful. Um, so so that, that that just tells us something about what can be correlated with what, conditioned on what. Um, but the real world could be compatible with multiple different Bayes nets and all the Bayes nets that are compatible with the conditional dependencies observed in the world are valid. Um, so if I have a X call, you know, arrow from X to Y and arrow from Y to X, these are the same graph in terms of Bayes nets. Because basically I say, I've assumed nothing. They're not the same graph from a causal interpretation. So, so the only thing that's added when we, we talk about causality is now what we're saying is um, they're the same as concerns a fixed distribution, right? So, 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 so two, two Bayes nets, if they imply the same conditional dependencies, right, like, we, we can't tell apart which is the right one just by looking at data from a single distribution. But where they differ is they have different implications about what would happen if I were to go and monkey with the uh, data generating process. So what this means, the conducting intervention is to um, do something to how one variable takes its value. The, the classic way of thinking is what we call a do intervention. So it's basically you would completely ignore the parents of a node in the graph. It's like you deleted all the incoming arrows and you just set that node, hard set it to some value. Think of this as like the treatment assignment in a randomized control trial. I don't care what was the probabilistic process according to which people were assigned treatments based on some background set of covariates. I just say, these people, you know, flip a coin. It doesn't, it no longer listens to any of those other variables. It just listens to the coin. Um, that's not the only kind of intervention we could think about. In a lot of these contexts, it's more useful to think about something like a soft intervention, which is like, um, the value, uh, you, you have a feature that, you know, gets like sort of by default, whatever value it was going to take. And then someone has the ability to, to, to manipulate it. Um, and this is what's going to show up in like strategic classification calls a soft intervention. I think the same one could be articulated kind of in terms of the other modulo across structure. Yeah. So if you, if you had some data, you knew that one of the data points, the P was, was just generated at random, would you still be able to use that as an intervention even though you didn't generate it? Uh, sort of, like, could you use some, some data and just- So what you could do is, if, if I have the, if I have the graph, mm -hmm. if I know the graph, mm -hmm. and assuming that I observe a sufficient set of errors, like I observe, um, there's many different valid identification formula, but one thing I could do is, for example, say that I know all the parents, I get to observe all the parents of the thing that I'm calling the treatment, then I don't need to go and do a, a randomized control trial. I can, I can do what's, I can estimate the propensity scores and then I could do like a propensity score reweighting. And then in practice from a statistical perspective, there's a, there's a million different things that people do. And there's, um, you know, there's matching algorithms, whatever, but just from an identification stand, standpoint, it's like, hey, if I, if, I, if I control for the parents, estimate the propensity weights, like, I, I can identify the treat any treatment effect that I could have gotten from like a randomized control trial. And that's all conditioned on the integrity of like, is the graph real? Do you believe in the graph? I think that's where the rubber hits the road in a lot of places is that the world doesn't just consist of the variables that you put in your graph. And even to the extent that like, it's built of things that at a high conceptual level, like resemble the things you have measurements for, the measurement doesn't capture everything about it. Like even in the classic examples people have of like smoking causes tar in lungs causes cancer. Like, what is the measurement of tar in lungs? What is the actual quantitative measurement that captures everything you need to know about the, you know, the, the tar composition in someone's lungs such that you completely screen off the effect of smoking? And I think it doesn't exist. Um, yeah? Does it make sense to also think about, um, like, hidden nodes? So, like, nodes who don't necessarily make it, but sure. Like, so you could think that there's a separate consideration, right, of, like, what is the graph? 
and then which nodes do we observe? And some of those considerations are maybe already sort of like committed to just when you draw the graph, because the truth is like, what is an arrow in a causal graph? Like an arrow is really just, um, like there's multiple valid causal graphs co co compatible with any data. And, and, and partly there's a choice of description. Like what is the level of uh, detail in which I draw the graph? And, and when we get to like time out fairness, if we get, <laughs> we're able to get that far, you know, Lily, who, uh, who's a philosopher at Yale, who came through a CS mass uh, background, did some influential work. And fairness has, has a very smart critique about this, that a lot of people try to conceptualize of uh, what it means, what discrimination means in terms of like the direct effect of race. And the question is, what do we mean by direct effect? Direct effect is actually always like an artifact of representation. There's always some mediator uh, if you just zoom in on the graph. And so that this kind of is like a like a weirdly ambiguous way of trying to articulate what we mean by by discrimination and kind of give someone always the ability to say that there's no discrimination. Um, cool. OK. So now what is responsible AI? Uh, high level. You know, I'll, I'll focus in particular on, on lines of research on robustness, explainability, fairness. Um, am I, I minimize this thing that I can actually see my slides on my laptop. Right. And again, problems that have all sort of frustrated attempts to, to formulate them in some satisfying way in, in purely predictive terms. What are they concerned? They all concern, they all express concerns about deployment of AI technology in society. Will it break and harm people? Uh, um, can people trust it? Uh, will this affect you know, discriminatory outcomes? Um, all kind of, I think, have fit this, this narrative where, where, where they, you know, people sort of went headlong into developing uh, methods, kind of backed out, and were like, we, we don't actually agree about what problem we are. And now suddenly there's this big pocket of, of, of a kind of, uh, one of these non-conventional uses of causality, using causal language, causal formalism, but not for purposes of estimating a treatment effect, doing something slightly different. And, and, and the, the, the central question, like the, the philosophical question here sort of is like, what does these things have in common? And like, why do they seem at this moment to sort of all be sharing methodological DNA? So, um, so, so I'll, I'll get into, I'll start just going through these vignettes one by one and try to show, show how, how things have played out there. And, and and kind of paint this parallel story. Um, my argument about you know why the, what the common structure is is ultimately I think that a, a lot of these problems in the first place the the reason why they're they're bracketed out not just subsumed into like the main trunk of ML research the reason why they're not you know feel like we feel like we need a different thing is is is, is the very fact that like they're not just about prediction and, and and ultimately like almost every quantitative question in some sense if it's not a predictive question has some in some sense, a causal question. It's a question of mechanism. Um, and in general, I think we could think of societal, like what, if we have a societal concern, in some sense, I think all, a lot of these problems are, at some qualitative level really are causal in the sense that it doesn't necessarily mean, I wanna be very clear of distinguishing, it doesn't necessarily mean that I think that like the, the formalism of causality or that the quantitative methods of causality uh, have a silver bullet here, or even are even necessarily the most productive path to talking about them. I'm just saying that, like, at their core, there there's a set of commitments about, um, you know, like what should we be doing? Why is the world the way it is? Um, what would a proposed, you know, the implementation of a proposed technology or of a proposed procedure for doing things? What impact would it have on people? Or, or what could people in light of technology, you know, do to better their situations and how do we communicate that to them? I think all these questions, they have, there's something about, you know, involve, involve people doing things and these things having ramifications. And I think that's sort of like all it takes to, to take us sort of out of the pure predictive realm. Um, right, so I think in some sense, answering these problems coherently fundamentally requires making some commitments about, I you know, maybe structure is even too jargony. They require making some commitments about the world. We we have some, um, you know, we we feel differently about uh, a disparity in one case and another because we have some commitments about what factors went into something, um, about you know why why do existing disparities come about um, that 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 it's sort of inescapable that ultimately when you say you know what should we do what's the appropriate fairness measure at some point you're making some commitments about about how the world works or has worked. Um, right. 
And okay, so let me let me take a look at uh, ro robustness and adaptation. And there, there, there's a wide spectrum of stuff going on in the field. Um, I tend to, I guess, relatively speaking, um, uh, you know, I, I'm not like a card carrying theorist, but I think in in this world, I tend to be more of a neat than a scruffy, and I, I tend to favor trying to. I, I'm I'm on the side that 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 is tried to express these problems in, in, in kind of causal terms where there actually is an identified solution. Um, that's not the only approach. I think, you know, these problems have actually been talked about for, for, for quite a while and using different languages in the history of statistics, et cetera, but maybe, maybe um, revitalize discussion in light of deep learning. The main, the main branch of research here has sort of just said, hey, we're concerned about distribution shift. It's sort of, sort of say, let's just like kind of proceed with a deep learning playbook. And this is what's happening in NLP. It's what's happening in computer vision. It's what's happening in the sort of just generic, you know, um, deep learning conferences. People say, okay, distribution shift, it's a thing. Let's come up with examples of distribution shift, build some data sets, and, and let's try stuff. The problem is that this is somehow like fundamentally different from what we're doing in supervised learning. And supervised learning, is, it's not clear that like they're, isn't the model architecture that is capable of doing all the NLP problems that we want, you know, if only we have, you know, enough representative examples. But when it comes to distribution shift, it's actually like there, there are different mechanisms that could be at play where fundamentally you can't have a common solution because if one mechanism is at play, doing the right thing means you're doing the wrong thing in a different situation and vice versa. Um, a simple case of this is, is covariate shift and label shift. If I believe that what's happening is like whatever generates the inputs is, is, that, that's the process that's changing, but the probability of you know, the, the target given the input is not changing. That's the covariate shift setting. P of Y given X is domain invariant. Then I'll basically say, I, I don't really need to change what I'm doing. I, 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 the, the, if, I, if I can get the optimal predictor on the source distribution and I don't have model misspecification, it's going to be cool in the target. This is not true under label shift. Under label shift, I have to adopt the predictor. And so if I do the right thing from a perspective of like, uh, a, like a, a method that's valid under label shift assumption, it will do the wrong thing in general under covariate shift and vice versa. So the question is, now, now you sort of have a situation, it's not obvious that there can even be like a one method to rule them all. And there's a question, so, so if you construct a benchmark, you say, okay, uh, you know, a grad student puts together 10 challenge data sets or 10 data set pairs, but you know, there's an arbitrary choice of do I do I overrepresent situations that look like this or situations that look like that or situations that look like some third scenario where none of these methods work. And uh, each one will give you a different answer about what's the right method. And so you have this weird situation where people, they're, they're building these benchmarks, but they're missing this question of what are the benchmarks representative of? We're not sure. Um, also, what is the relevant size of a benchmark now? The relevant size of a benchmark is not the number of images you have or the number of text documents you have. It's the number of distributions that you're looking at. And so now we, we don't know like what is the distribution over distribution. This, this object doesn't exist. So they're not representative of, of something. We're not, we're not really sure what they're examples of. And even if they were, the, the, the size, the data set size of like a benchmark, you know, with 10, 10 distribution pairs or even 100 is actually like, you know, <laughs> what, what can you say on the basis of that? What people have done, they build these benchmarks and they've gone and they've tried things, domain adversarial neural networks. Um, um, batch norm parameter uh, adaptation, where you you basically recalculate the batch norm statistics on the target data. Um, there's a whole um, pseudo labeling type approach. There's this whole litany of, of methods, and some of them even work well enough on this benchmark that it's worth. It's not. I'm not. I'm not, even, I'm not I wouldn't even take so bold a position as to say there's no value coming out of this. I think some of them are kind of interesting that they seem to do well on on so many data in the benchmark. Sometimes maybe even ask the question of okay, maybe it's at least worth noting like what what like let's try to actually formalize what are the situations where these methods do well and and where would they fail and what is it about these benchmark data sets and this is often a fruitful exercise so you know there's a lot of excitement in 2016 about these domain adversarial networks it was a nice intuition it says let's just map data into a space where um you can't tell which distribution an example came from in representation space and where your classifier is accurate in the source data from the source distribution from which you have labels the problem with this is, is if you think about it like, you know, a little bit more rigorously, is that it's sort of obvious where this necessarily fails. And all that has to happen for this to fail is for the class balance to change. If the class proportion changes and the data is indistinguishable in the source, in, in the representation space, and you're accurate on the source data, then you necessarily are like lower bounding your target error. 
And, and so why didn't this show up in the benchmarks? Well, because, you know, as academics, we often tend to just reflexively build data sets that have class balance. Uh, it's just like the nature of a lot of our benchmarks, CIFAR, MNIST, ImageNet. And so this was happening. People were saying, I take CIFAR, and then we go to like funky CIFAR, where they all have, you know, exact match proportion. There's other weird things going on in this literature, which I think is the community being confused now about what is the role of a validation set. Um, you know, the, 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 the contract here ostensibly is that you don't get labeled target data. Uh, most of the methods people are proposing actually don't work if you don't have labeled target data. And the dirty trick is things that like the methods will fail eight runs out of 10 or something like that. And the target, the test set is being used to choose which run makes it into the paper or which hyperparameters are used. So there's a lot of funkiness going on in this area and the methods don't, you know, the community is not quite sure what it's doing, but but it's also that, you know, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater. There, there are interesting things being done that should be looked into further. Um, but this is sort of an area where we are, like people saying like, oh, like, let's just do the prediction thing. Let's just say, try add, add a layer, delete a layer, you know, add skip connections, add a discriminator, do all these different things. And then people realizing, wait a minute, um, you know, the, the world's more complicated and the problem may not even be well specified. We need to be clear about what are the scenarios where a method might be applicable and, and recognize the fundamental impossibility that there is no like cure-all. There's no method that'll work in all scenarios, yeah? So I would agree with that statement maybe two or three years ago, but isn't like the, the cool, like the, what the cool kids do now is that they, they just collect a much larger data set that, and completely ignore the problem. Great point. Um, um, it, it's a great point. It, 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 even there, I, I think, so, so you can look at say, there's different categories of problems and some this helps you with and some it doesn't. So, so where, where does it help you? Um, one by the opposite, let's, let's look at the covariate shift assumption. Covariate shift assumption basically says there is one model to rule them off. That's not a general true statement about problems where machine learning is deployed. That's a statement about some subset of problems. Object recognition might be like that. Like there is a model that will mostly agree with us on natural images about like what is the focal object among images where there is a focal object or whatever that it is, it's gonna work on data set one and two and three and four and five and six. Now, the problem why you can't come up with that model is there's a separate issue. Does the model conceivably exist? And could you conceivably have identified that model based on your small data set? And, you know, a, a example I like to use is like, imagine you have a data set that consists only of indoor cats and outdoor dogs. Now at test time, you see, uh, outdoor cats and some indoor dogs start showing up. And the truth is fundamentally, there's nothing you could have done with indoor cats and outdoor dogs short of mind reading that'll tell you what's the right thing to do. Because if, if, if what the, the, the benchmark creator had in their head, if what they thought the category, the labels A and B meant were indoor versus outdoor, you should do one thing. And if they thought dog versus cat, you should do something else. So, so now, now if, if you had a situation where you're like, okay, we, uh, we just, we just grew the support. We just had a billion examples. And in that much larger data set, there are indoor cats and there are, there are, there are outdoor cats and indoor dogs, whatever. Now you're like, okay, we're, we're okay. So, so, so that, that issue, and so I think this applies to things like self-driving cars. That's I think why it's the bet that a lot of large companies, and uh, the question is how far does that get you? Just how much within the stuff you actually see in the present day in the world, can you collect and on account of that not break or on things that conceivably, I mean, it's to some degree an empirical question. I think it's this thing where we don't really know. We don't know what's the limits of that paradigm. Is that going to get us to like 99%, 99.9? Is it going to get us to a point where like, uh, you know, um, you know, we stop like, you know, like kind of just being really, really, really nervous about self-driving cars? I don't know. But that's now, now label shifts a very different story, a story where any kind of model of shift, the missing and shift has this category. Many, many kinds of problems, especially the ones I encounter in healthcare, have this property that P of Y given X is not fixed across domains. There's not a fixed model. So there's the model that's the best model here is not the best model there and vice versa. So the only thing you could do is to adapt coherently. You can't just be like, oh, if I've only seen enough data. And, and, and an example of this would be like, um, let's say I have a symptom checker. And on the basis of the symptom checker, I want to say, what's the likelihood that somebody has COVID? And the answer is just, it's a very different probability in 2018 than it is in 2020 than it is in 2022. Because it's just the, the underlying prevalence is changing. And P of Y given X is like, this is not a separable problem. And it's like just a matter of growing the support. Sorry, oh, just like recline. 
Um, great. So then it's like, what could causality give for us? Um, um, actually, let me go in the opposite order, I think. Um, um, so, so causality, like, and, and here's like in our lab, kind of like a, a language of not just bringing causality, but bringing causality and finding a way to make it compatible, like causal structural assumptions with things we do in deep learning is, is to, to be able to come up with a, a kind of template for, for articulating these kinds of problems and seeing when they're, when, when, when the solution is actually identified. And we can say something like, okay, what, what are the, what are the domains in play? What are the environments? How many environments do we have? How many samples do we have from each? What is the commitment about underlying structure? You know, like, are we saying, uh, like, this is a cartoon, this is the label shift problem. We say the only thing that's allowed to change is the class proportion, but P of X given Y doesn't change. The class conditionals are invariant. So in that setup, you know, one way of kind of making a causal cartoon out of that is you say Y causes X and I intervene on Y, but, but uh, the way that X takes its value condition on Y remains domain invariant. Uh, we express a set of commitments about visibility, which variables are observed in which domains. In the classic domain adaptation problem, you say, I see X and Y in the source data. I only see X in the target data, and that's what you got to work with. Um, there's a set of concerns about what's allowed to change, uh, not just what's allowed to change. So in this case, there's a structural, a graphical notion of what's allowed to change, like which factor in the graph can be intervened upon. In this case, it's like, we can whack Y, but we can't. Um, uh, touch the way that, you know, that, this, that that's the only, that, that's the locus of intervention. Like the do intervention is on Y, not on, not on X. Um, but there's also kind of statistical concerns. Like when you intervene on Y, uh, are you allowed to go out of support? You know, if Y is the class distribution, can I, can I, can I mess with Y in such a way that I now at test time encounter a class that I've never seen before at training time? And there you start trespassing outside of what like the causal graphical language gives you and start going into like what can, um, statistical language give you. And there we actually have some positive results. So still under the strong assumption of P of X given Y being domain invariant, but we can handle the arrival of a new never before seen class and actually show that still given only labels for like K classes, the optimal K plus one way predictor uh, can be identified. Again, this is all under the label shift assumption. So, you know, we're in this weird area of like, you know, which which assumptions, which really hard assumptions can we make? We, we, we try to walk this dance where we say, okay, classical methods of this flavor deal with this kind of structure and only work in low dimensional data. We're trying to make a leap of hope. We're still committing to the structure, but we can lift all this stuff to practical algorithms that will work in concert with deep learning, where you can let deep learning do what it's good at, let statistical manipulations do what they're good at, um, come up with a way of fashioning like uh, a problem for the deep learning where it looks like a deep learning problem. Like the only way we know how to use deep learning coherently is like when the train test paradigm applies because we can't sort of like make a priori guarantees, but they sort of say, okay, we'll train the model, come up with a surrogate problem for deep learning, let it do what it does and find a way to instrumentalize this using the structure we have into a solution to the other domain problem. I won't go deep into all the details of these kinds of works, but we've done this in the case of label shift. Um, um, where here we found, figured out ways that we could basically train a source classifier, treat it as a black box, feed through all of our data through the source classifier, um, calculate the, 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 the confusion matrix, which turns out to be domain invariant under label shift, the class conditional confusion matrix, or call them normalized, um, have a, 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 um, a, an estimator based in like classifier output space that uses sort of the, the, the moments of, of, of the classifier outputs on the target data and condition on each of the classes in the source data to identify the, the, the target label class portion. It's, it's, it's a little bit complicated, but I'm not, you know, this is a technical talk that the high level point to say, hey, hey, we make this structural commitment. We could do something that makes sense. We can say that as long as our classifier is good in some way that we can assess on the source data, then we can get an estimator that has nice statistical properties. We can get like finite sample bounds on, on, on our estimator of the class proportion Q of Y. We can use this to update our, our predictions post hoc. Um, still under the label shift assumption, but now allowing that we can go out of support that a new class can arrive. Um, we tackled the problem of a similar kind of set of routines for dealing with what's called PU learning. Um, so our, our real goal was to get to this, but we just had to take a detour uh, to build one more primitive, which is to say, not only can there be label shift, but also a new class can arise. First, we had to say, well, let's do that when there's only one previously seen class. It turns out to be exactly the problem of learning from positive and unlabeled data only. Um, here, the routine looks a little bit different. Instead of training a source classifier, we train a domain discriminator, but we're able to basically say, 
if, if this model is good in some mild sense, which we can assess based on the domain discrimination test set performance, we're able to instrument it to a solution to the mixture proportion problem, use it to identify the optimal target predictor. We're able to lift this even to the problem now when you have both label shift and a new class happening. So we call it open set label shift. This is a paper with my student. In fact, this whole line where I should just point out, um, it start, started with a collaboration with Yushang Wang and Alex Smola in uh, 2018, but largely it's an agenda that's been driven by my student, Saurabh Garg, um, and together with his co-advisor, Siva Balakrishnan. Um, so um, check them out, they're great. Um, so we've been able to deal with these things. And we've also, together with Siva and also my student, Helen Joe, who works on healthcare data, we, we've been able to explore other kinds of structures that are neither covariate shift nor label shift and, and kind of get at like what's fundamentally different about these kinds of problems. One that we looked at recently is something that we call missingness shift. And what, what we, the, the motivation for this work is we were working on uh, COVID data for the local hospital system. And we asked the question of uh, how many people have COVID vaccine? And we already know the answer is somewhere like 85 to 90% in Southwestern Pennsylvania based on CDC data. And the hospital says it's 45%. Why is it 45%? Uh, it could just be that this particular hospital system has like only anti-vaxxers. Not such a plausible explanation. More, more likely is a lot of these people, they got vaccinated at Rite Aid or they got vaccinated at like the football field during a massive vaccination event. And they didn't, they didn't come into the hospital and tell their doctor, I got vaccinated, put it in my health record. So it just never made it in. Sort of the hospital system tomorrow said, we're not recording this information reliably. We need to start adding a question about COVID vaccination on, on the intake form that we give every patient. So instantly, the, the binary feature that is, you know, is there a, a, a had COVID vaccination tag in your medical record would go from, you know, being 45% positive to let's say like 80% positive, 85% positive overnight. In what way should you adapt your predictor? And it turns out, well, whatever was the optimal source predictor is no longer optimal. Um, and so there's a whole dance here to figure out, is the solution identified? Interesting thing turns out to be that the, the optimal clean predictor, like the, the predictor, like what would you predict in the world where everyone was measured is not identified, but the optimal target predictor is identified. It's an interesting thing. It turns out like we, we can't know for sure what was the level of missingness in the source or in the target, but we can know what is the relative level of missingness. And then this allows us to do an adjustment. So again, um, this is what uh, Microsoft PowerPoint thinks pitfalls look like, which seem uh, actually quite nice. Um, so again, this is, on, on one hand, it's like causality gave us a way of taking this like wild west of domain adaptation where it's like anything could happen and you know, people kind of claiming solutions, but they can't be solutions because they're subsuming irreconcilably different problems to say, okay, here, here are precise problems. Here are precise technical machinery that works in those precise problems. Pitfall is those pre precise problems are still, you know, even the fact that we've lifted this stuff to all work in the deep learning setting, it's still the structural assumptions are so strong. And like a humbling moment for us, I think, is looking at COVID data and that, you know, the textbook case for label shift is like all that's changing is prevalence, but not class conditional distributions. Textbook case should be uh, a change in like a pandemic, right? Change in prevalence of a disease. Like this, the, this what are the symptoms of the disease don't change, but the amount of people that have the disease do. But that's not really true. It might be true over very, very short time spans. But that's not what's going on in reality. What's going on in reality is You know, public health officials are scrambled. They weren't locking down nursing homes. Then they realize, like, oh crap, we got to do that. So they start locking down the nursing homes. As soon as they do that, the age distribution of the infected changes wildly. Um, people go from getting their first infection to getting their second. Suddenly, the mortality rate changes. The symptom profile changes. The virus itself is evolving. So we're in this weird setting where it's like, hey, we can get to the nature of the problem. We can see what's wrong with the status quo. We can think about these things clearly by injecting some causal thinking. And at the same time. How confident do we feel that say, oh, well, you got his label shift. Here's the method. Go use it. It's not so clear. And so that's like the, you know, I think, um, you know, the, like the humble kind of confession here would be sort of like God doesn't care about your benchmarks, but he also doesn't care about our theoretical assumptions or she doesn't. So, mm -hmm. yes. So you, you start taking step back to the conversation of the role of causality in so far you've been talking about the role of causality in wellness, sustainability, fairness, but as you've mentioned, this comes from properties of the problem itself, not of these 
properly situated sensor array assessment, right? And so this seems more like something that applies to all of machine learning rather than the responsible ML style property. Like ML in healthcare, then any machine learning that we're applying in healthcare would have all of these applied. Absolutely. I, I think there's a question of like, there's a question of like, I don't know, what's the right way of putting it? I think in some ways there's a question of like turf or something. There's a question of like, what is it that different communities choose to, to focus on and what don't they choose to focus on? Right, like um, measurement is fundamentally a problem of working with data. What 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 is this data? What does it represent? Uh, what is the underlying construct? It's not a conversation that necessarily we have in ICML very often, but it's a, a fundamental concern if you're if you're using data to drive any kind of decision making process in an organization. So I think it's not a question of like, do some problems have responsible ML and some don't? Um, I think you come up with anyone any of these concerns. Obviously, certain problems where these concerns are more salient and certain problems where they're less salient. I think, you know, you can more easily get away without worrying about shifts in distribution in terms of just getting a passable uh, machine translation system than you can in getting like a risk prediction system for healthcare, just in terms of rel how relatively stable, you know, are, are those populations. Um, but right, I don't think it's so much as like cleaving are these problems like, you know, on a per problem basis, sort of like, why are these things broken out now as like concerns that maybe are not addressed by the way we address things and say that the the down the middle icml NeurIPS iclr type paper um so there are some steps forward just to be a little bit optimistic i think one step forward is or at least one one one, one hope is to say okay the, like we start with like the most strict cartoon the strict cartoon says hey this problem has a has a coherent solution maybe we can go um maybe we can do something with that um, but then you're like, but I'm dependent on these very, very strict assumptions. One question is just how much can I, can I come up with a language for talking about just how much my, 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 my solutions deteriorate if those assumptions are not met perfectly. And the analog for this in the causality literature is something called sensitivity analysis, right? You say, okay, maybe I haven't controlled for all confounders, but I can make a statement of like the amount of uncontrolled for confounding would have to be at least so heroic in order to totally invalidate you know, my, my, my procedure and my, the sign of my conclusions. And, and, and one, you know, line of work here, this plug my students are up again, that we've been working on is something that we call uh, RLS bench, but it's basically a way of taking like extreme label shift scenarios or, or, or label shift scenarios across a, a variety of levels of extremity and compounding them by some deviations from the assumption that, you know, P of X given Y is domain invariant. So sort of compounding using some of these benchmarks to, to, to simulate shifts in P of X given Y and get a sense for just how much does, like if there is, if there is a true shift in label distribution, just how severe does the, does the, does the, the shift in the class conditional have to be for it to be like not even worthwhile to, to do our correction. Um, yeah. Um, we, we like kind of at a high level, it's like, you, you, you don't want to commit a priori to knowing what the shift is because the whole point is it's like unpredictable. So you commit to say maybe something of like, what is the, the nature of what's allowed to shift? But, you know, you want to have a method, you know, if you have a, a good label shift method, then it's like if the class distribution turns out to be exactly the same as it was during training, you want to perform at least, almost exactly as well as you did, you know, without having done any correction. Um, if there's a severe shift and suddenly one class is 100% of the test data, then you want to get close to 100% accuracy. Because if one class becomes 100% of the target data, then you can get 100% accuracy if all you do is just recognize the class proportion, right? Like if I find myself, I'm discriminating dogs versus cats, and maybe I only have an 80% accurate classifier. But now I find myself in like a room where there's a million dogs and zero cats. If only I could just figure out what is the proportion of dogs and know that it's close to 100%, then I should have it close to 100% accuracy. So you want to be able to handle kind of you know, within the rules of the game, which are defined by the assumed structure, shifts of any kind. So I just want to go through really quick. I, think, I don't know, how much time do I have? Like five minutes or something? All right, so I'm going to like kind of go through really fast. And so another area um, is this literature on explanation. And there's a whole story, there's a whole kind of, you know, explanation has been used as kind of like a, 
like a giant box to absorb everything that we want to accomplish ever, whether it's trustworthiness, ca even causality, people talk about uh, domain robustness, and insight, fairness, whatever, whatever. Um, but, you know, it, it sort of becomes this like overloaded box people aren't quite sure what they mean by explanation so he's kind of turned to like proposing methods and there's been this whole literature and says well you know more or less the framing is to say let's let's tell someone what were the important features again what does it mean to be important what does it mean for a particular feature to be important for a particular example's prediction not quite articulated kind of living in a soupy vague area people come up with things they're called you know lime shap integrated gradients attention um and then, you know, of, of course, a lot of us, you know, the problem is that no one was sure what was this problem to which these things are the solution. So us and other people have shown a bunch of cases where you could take the same model, making the same prediction on just about every example in the population, and you could produce a model that is identical to that model in every way, but the explanation method uh, will give you a completely different answer for what are the important features. So it's like, in some sense, there's nothing fundamentally that links any of these explanation methods to what the model is actually doing. And um, so there's this kind of crisis of like, what's going on? What's the purpose? And so there's this area now called counterfactual explanations, which um, quibbles about the name aside, at least comes up with a, uh, a more specific use case. So it trims down like, why are we doing? What are we doing? What they say is, imagine someone who's a, who's the subject of a decision, who's like having a, a, a lending decision made about them. And you say, well, what would that person have to do differently? What would have, what would be the, alternative feature vector for them to have such that uh, they would have gotten the positive decision instead of the negative decision. And the problem, of course, that you come up, run into immediately is there's an infinite set of alternative vectors that would get the opposite prediction. So which one is the relevant counterfactual? Um, but at least here, they've pinned down a question that's a real social question, right? The question is, how do I provide recourse to someone? How do I... So, so it at least then allows you to start asking critical questions. So Manish had a paper, um, a bunch of other people start saying, okay, kind of explanations It's a paper by Sandra Walker and, and colleagues. Um, it's great, but then, 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 you know, um, um, Manish and a bunch of other people start noticing, well, okay, wait a second. One, one is you, you're sort of like assuming that you know what is the relevant cost structure to, you know, like what, the way they were kind of expressing counterfactual explanations in the original formulation was like, they're basically equivalent to adversarial examples. They're just saying like, find the nearest point that gets the alternative. But like it, it, another point in input space is not necessarily like, a, doesn't necessarily correspond to an action a person could actually take. If I say, if only you were two years younger and uh, had, uh, you know, triple the income and, uh, but you know, more years of work experience, you would have, it's like, well, what do I do with that? The only way I can increase my income is by getting another job. And then I'm gonna have lower years of employment history at the current job. I can't move my age. So, so ultimately like giving someone this kind of recourse or giving someone this kind of recommendation, it reveals a couple of things. One is that we have to be concerned with ultimately what are the actual actions that someone could take for these to be useful? What are the actual actions that someone could feasibly take in the real world um, that, would, that would correspond to getting these actions, we have to know something about, you know, what is their actual cost structure. Um, and also it reveals something else, which is what it reveals is that framing the problem as prediction was never the right thing to do in the first place. Because once we train a predictive model, and then we start going and telling people, here's how you should change your features to get a different decision. As soon as they change the feature, the distribution has changed. And so what it reveals is kind of like a fundamental incoherence that we've been calling a lot of things prediction problems, but there's sorts of things that economists would have recognized from the beginning there weren't really prediction problems, there were mechanism problems, that we were participating in a set of incentives. And if I go and tell you, you know, there were some papers that were naively saying, let's give everyone recourse, give everyone the ability to flip their predictions, we want to make it as easy as possible. And the problem is, if I give everyone a button that they could press with no effort, and then they magically get a loan, the bank is going to go bankrupt overnight. So the point is, like, we have to be concerned also that in the very first place, we want to be setting incentives that, that uh, we want to be able to tell people, what, what is it that you could do that would make your prediction better, but we want to have a model in the first place that's actually setting a coherent set of incentives where if people do these things, you know, you actually should uh, be more likely to give them a loan because they're more likely to repay. Um, so causality is kind of entered the fray here. And there's a, a nice paper from Karimi where, you know, they start saying, well, okay, we can have, what if we have a causal model over the features? And now we can look and say, well, what are the, in, what are the things people can intervene on? And, and take into account the fact that 
uh, interventions that people take on their features will actually affect the outcome. They'll also have downstream effects on other variables. You know, when you go out to improve your, uh, you know, number of lines of credit, you're going to also, in so doing, incur like, uh, you know, uh, an additional credit inquiry. And so, like, your feature interventions on one on one feature are going to have downstream effects on other features. So, make these nice cartoon models and think this whole th thing through in, in a kind of coherent way, or I say philosophically coherent way, but. The, the big drawback is that do we actually ever believe that I am in a lending situation where I've got these like 12 features and they form this causally sufficient graph and I can actually like anyone who's like actually an economist or actually like works on treatment effect estimate or someone works in public health, you know, like would know that like you have generation long disputes about can we even agree on the sign of a particular treatment effect, let alone can we agree on all these like path specific coefficients corresponding to like every single manipulation among every single variable in a graph. So it's a nice story. It kind of gets at what are we hoping to do in a, in a conceptual way. It even gives us it, some nice mathematical machinery in the sense that it's like nice to write papers about, but is a machinery that we could actually use. And I think this is where we're, we're back in this, this problem. You know, on, on the other side, thinking like, well, if people are going to change what they're doing, can we, you know, should we be learning the predictor differently? There's been a, a parallel lineage of research. It started with Moritz Hart talking about causal strategic, sorry, just strategic classification where they just think of the whole thing as gaming. You know, they don't account for that. Hey, if you actually go out and get a higher income, you actually are more likely to pay your loan or something like that. Um, or if you go out and get more research experience, maybe you actually are more likely to succeed in PhD. Um, um, they just think of the whole thing as gaming, basically in terms of adversarial examples. But to their credit, it's like this is back in 2015, 2016. Um, subsequently, you've had a bunch of papers. Um, by another one by um, Manish and Kleinberg in 2020, one by uh, Yonadav in, in, in 2020 at ICML. Here's another one by um, uh, Becca Vode that does a similar thing where they start incorporating some simplistic causal model. In, in all these cases, the causal model is just sort of something like the covariates are the parents of the outcome. And so it's sort of like a, almost like a, you know, was it the opposite of like naive Bayes kind of graphical model. Um, so more recently, and this is work that's in preparation, has been published. Um, some students of mine, uh, Tom Yen and Shantanu Gupta, have looked at sort of the general setting of causal models, accounting for the fact that, hey, you don't just have parents in a causal graph. Often you make decisions based on children of the, the latent factor that like, you know, what you're after is research skill or something is what you want to be selecting people on. But it's really only observed with any kind of fidelity after you've already hired the person. And your signals include not just causal ancestors, but also proxies, right? Like a recommendation letter is arguably like downstream from, um, you know, the level of skill that someone's acquired. And so we can come up with a whole formalism for thinking, hey, if, if I deploy a model and people respond, and then I deploy a model and people respond, um, this is actually a very powerful structure. I don't even have to know the graph a priori. If the nodes form a causally sufficient graph, we can come up with basically a way of showing that by deploying like an intelligently chosen sequence of mechanisms and observing how do people respond and what is the effect on the outcome, we can actually back out the structure of the causal graph and solve for the optimal policy. So it's kind of cool. Like the part of me that's like drawn to like mathematically elegant solutions and, and even to like the stylized insight of like, hey, this is an interesting way of doing experiments. We're able to get causal knowledge that isn't otherwise identifiable from observational data not just by intervening directly on nodes, but by setting incentives, which induce other people to intervene on nodes and figuring out what did they intervene on and what were the effects and piecing it all together. It's a cool story, um, but it's a stylized story. Do we actually believe that like we could just go and now say to someone at a company like, okay, you're going to deploy, this is going to be your hiring policy in Q1 and this one in Q2 and this one in Q3 and this one in Q4, and then we're going to put it together and we'll have a causally sufficient graph that perfectly describes like how how skills form and how they relate to the, the things that you measure not really so um you know i'd go further into you know sort of also line of research on uh, uh in fairness and 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 ways that people have tried to express causal definitions of fairness have tried to tease out why we think that some sources of disparity um are okay or or at least not you know things that um mandate intervention by particular actors and other ones are uh you know give different normative prescriptions um which again in encounter similar kinds of problems that they're, they're they're a nice way of thinking about the problem they're a nice way of articulating you know why we think differently about different situations and giving a language for posing normative questions but at the end of the day 
we don't actually believe we're going to like take 40 variables that characterize some kind of hiring process and put them all together and have the causally sufficient DAG and estimate all the path specific effects and agree about them. So, so at a high level, uh, this is my story. So thank you.